and welcome on behalf of Medscape. I'm Dr. Catherine Lefebvre, a neurologist in Saratoga Springs, New York, and I have a great pleasure to be talking with my friend, Dr. Alberto Espe today. Alberto is an endowed professor of neurology, the division chief and endowed chair of the Gardner Family Center for Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders in Cincinnati. And we're here today to talk about highlights in Parkinson's disease in 2023. Welcome, Alberto. Thank you, Catherine. I'm delighted to be with you. Right, so maybe we'll start out with the biomarkers. And, you know, I attended the AN meeting in the spring, and uh, there was uh, some buzz around the uh, SIN1 uh, skin testing. And I know there's uh, also CSF biomarkers. Um, so where do we stand? And is this something that, as a neurologist in practice, I should be doing or ordering for my patients? Well, it's a very interesting development. The C1 test uh, is a way to quantify the phosphorylated uh, conformation of synuclein. So it's a way to uh, determine the extent to which skin tissue contains synuclein in an aggregated fashion. And uh, we know that it is a reflection of the pathology elsewhere uh, synuclein is everywhere in the body and it is most accessible in the skin. And this test uh, is conducted by biopsying three regions of the body, neck, uh, leg, and then distal leg, the, the close, to the, close to the feet essentially. And it does two things. Uh, tells us how much of the synuclein in an aggregated state there is and how uh, much of degeneration there may be in terms of the nerve fibers that run through it. So it quantifies two different things. And it's interesting because it is the first test that has uh, a very, very high sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Uh, but more importantly, is uh, uh, interestingly helpful to separate Parkinson's from multiple systems atrophy, something that prior tests have not been able to accomplish. And uh, in fact, can, depending on the pattern of uh, 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 density of pathology, as well as of the relative loss of the small fibers, separate the Parkinson's from dementia Uri bodies, which in fact has been quite elusive in prior efforts. So this is a very uh, effective uh, way of uh, getting to a diagnosis of uh, Parkinson's as the syndrome, uh, obviously not necessarily to uh, help us with biologically subtyping the condition, but very important in terms of confirming that uh, we're dealing with a synuclein uh, disease uh, in the form of Parkinson's versus multiple system atrophy versus uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, and in fact, versus uh, pure autonomic failure, there is a different pattern for it. These are all the so-called synucleinopathies, and I think this is the best test so far, and it's minimally invasive. So how do you just apply this? Do you order this in, in patients early on to confirm a diagnosis, or if they don't respond well to treatment, well, what's your approach to this? I think for now, I would suspect that uh, in specialized, specialized clinics uh, that deal with Parkinson's disease, we probably don't need the test in the vast majority of patients. If we sort of uh, do our clinical examination and determine that the uh, diagnosis is uh, fairly clear. I think where the test might be most interesting would be in situations where there is diagnostic uncertainty. The first type of uncertainty is the one where we uh, determine someone is slow, but we might not say slow and Parkinsonian, but perhaps a non-Parkinsonian type of slowness. Uh, this could be one uh, area in which uh, the test could be very helpful. Though in this case, it would be very similar to what we currently do with that scans, uh, where we determine if there is uh, to be a dopamine deficiency that would be sort of fulfill the same purpose. What I think is most interesting is in those situations where we have uncertainty uh, among the Parkinsonisms, particularly if we think that a patient with what we have thought is Parkinson's disease has accrued features of what might appear to be an evolving multiple system atrophy. In that situation, uh, of all the tests that we currently have to try to distinguish uh, uh, multiple system atrophy from Parkinson's disease, the skin biopsy might become one of the early ones to think about. Uh, just by virtue of how sensitive it is to picking up the, the difference. And so I think in this situation, 
uh, this could end up changing how we approach uh, diagnostic workup of these patients uh, in a manner that I think uh, could turn out to be quite relevant. Uh, does it make a difference in terms of treatment at the moment one wonders that that might not yet be the case but it's always uh, important to at least if nothing else for prognostic reasons and also for understanding what thresholds of levodopa therapy to use for instance to know whether we're dealing with parkinson's disease versus multiple system atrophy and certainly uh, that applies to to the distinction between parkinson's and dementia or Lewy body. It's, uh, conditions that can look very similar early on and so this uh, would be another way to to be able to recognize the difference between the groups, between the individuals with these two diseases. Very good. So certainly a useful tool to have in our toolbox and, and less invasive than a CSF biomarker test. So thank you for that. There is another test that uh, uh, people may have heard, which is the seed amplification assay. Uh, the SYN1 test is quantitative. It allows us to quantify the uh, amount of uh, protein, the load of uh, protein that's uh, uh, in an aggregated state. The seed amplification assay is qualitative. It only allows us to answer yes or not, is there aggregated synuclein in this tissue I'm testing? Yeah. But it doesn't tell us how much of it there is. In the Lancet Neurology paper that made the rounds around the world that was hailed as a breakthrough, uh, we know that particular study showed that there was no correlation between a test positivity and any type of uh, Parkinsonism, whether it was predominantly motor versus no motor, whether it was REM behavior disorder or not. There was no correlation between it and severity of disease. There was no predictive ability to determine what kind of outcome patients would have and certainly will then therefore not be uh, uh, helpful for the purposes of uh, monitoring response to therapy or for subtyping. So I want to make sure that uh, these two tests are kept quite differently in terms of how we think through them. However, there are efforts to making it a, a central component to what's going to be referred to as the biological definition of Parkinson's disease. And I I'm a little concerned about that since it's simply a test of pathology, but in no way reflects any underlying biology. So that's very helpful to not throw all the biomarkers in the same box for sure. Yeah. Let's uh, let's switch topics. I've been kind of following the, the link between diabetes and Parkinson's this past year, and I was curious to hear your thoughts. You know, the um, GLP-1 receptor agonists are getting much more popular in the diabetes treatment. And, and uh, so what do we have to look at here and how does this um, influence our, our potential um, way to help patients? No, it's a great question and it's an evolving story. Uh, we've known for a number of years that uh, individuals who uh, had diabetes that were treated with uh, GLPR1 agonists uh, had a lower uh, uh, incidence of uh, Parkinson's uh, and that is a mark markedly lower incidence. We're talking about 30 to 40 percent reduced uh, incidence of later development of uh, uh, of Parkinson's. So uh, there is this connection at an epidemiologic level that the use of this particular therapy could have uh, uh, disease modifying effects. Uh, now, uh, two things are important to recognize here, and the first is that forever we've had what's referred to as the pharmacoepidemiology disconnect. That means that findings at an epidemiologic level that would suggest that there is a modifying effect of an intervention because of a relationship at a population level do not translate into actual disease modification once the trials are done. And this, there are many, many examples of this. Uh, in fact, it, it's invariable that we have a connection between uh, two variables at a population level that speaks about lower risk and lower risk does not translate once the disease state is established into a slower progression. Uh, the best example of that is uh, perhaps urate, the low urate is clearly associated with a great risk of Parkinson's, high urate, lower risk. Then it was only logical to test the hypothesis that increasing urate would in fact slow the, slow the progression of Parkinson's. That was accomplished to no avail. There was no difference. So this pharmacoepidemiologic disconnect has been universal in our history. We've never been able to translate uh, epidemiologic findings into disease modifying treatments. That then connects to the second point, which is that we know Parkinson's isn't a disease. 
it's a syndrome. And therefore, there are many biological subtypes uh, that are surely associated with what we today call Parkinson's disease. It is there a subtype in which insulin resistance happens to be not a downstream phenomenon, but an upstream abnormality, something that actually uh, is able to drive the disease subtype in individuals that have a particular problem uh, with the mechanisms about which glucagon-like receptors have a role. And, and we don't know. We don't know. Uh, so if there is to be an effect that emerges in the trials, and there is a preliminary results of one of the uh, trials that was just reported, uh, in, uh, conducted in France, that suggests a reduction in the UPDRS or a change in the UPDRS such that the, the motor severity is lower at the end of the study, it would have to be symptomatic. Uh, it would not be disease modifying. We'll have to figure out what that means, of course. Uh, but disease modification does require for us to pair the therapy with the mechanism of action at play in the recipients. And that mechanism of action must be pathogenic, not just a consequence of many processes, but a at a cause of one specific subtype. And we don't know where that is. I have asked colleagues that are leading these studies, whether they are recruiting this, for these studies with a specific asset that determines the extent to which this uh, uh, insulin resistance uh, marker that in the brain would be uh, indicative of individuals particularly vulnerable to this therapy, and that's not the case. The good news is that some studies have been preparing themselves for what? is referred to as the post-mortem of, of, the, of the study, which means study fails, but the assumption is the, the, there surely is people that are, will be people that uh, benefit from this and then we'll need to figure out who they are. And with bio specimens, biobanked, uh, blood, but particularly CSF, maybe other tissues, we could potentially determine if those that are gonna be in that category of responders might in fact be individuals that in a subsequent development we could select for or screen for and then potentially do another analysis enriching for those in whom we think that the particular mechanism is uh, most relevant uh, at a pathophysiologic level in them. So yeah. it's an evolving story. I think that there will be much more to learn, but I'm worried about this uh, idea. We've had many, many therapies with fantastic mechanisms of actions that have failed, largely because it's not the kind of mechanism we uh, uh, later have recognized to be quite as dominant in one subtype. It seems to be a common uh, expression, right? Now we know even 40% of uh, patients with Parkinson's have low urine. Well, that's too large a slice of the Parkinson's pie to uh, imply that it's somehow pathogenic in those 40%. Well, thanks for these words of caution. Uh, so maybe to close out our, our conversation, um, let's talk a bit more about therapeutic updates. And, you know, this is a big topic, but I think one thing that you have been particularly interested in is sort of the uh, continuous um, pump therapies, you know, to simplify um, medication administration for people with off symptoms. So, so what are we looking in that uh, sphere? Yes. Yeah, so in the next uh, year or so, there will be a total of three subcutaneous infusion systems. Uh, two are based on levodopa. Uh, one of them is a levodopa precursor uh, called phospholipidopa. Uh, and uh, one of them is apomorphine infusion. They are at different stages of review. All studies have been uh, concluded uh, very much uh, with positive outcomes. I, I think by and large, the uh, results are comparable among the infusion systems. Uh, uh, one is uh, produced by Abbey. Uh, one is produced by Neuroderm, uh, now uh, owned uh, by Mitsubishi, Tanabe, and the other one is uh, owned by U.S. World Meds uh, uh, that's now uh, owned by Supernus. So these three uh, infusion systems should help uh, uh, particularly for those individuals who have motor fluctuations that are associated with significant off-on changes and uh, perhaps uh, on-related dyskinesia, whom we are unable to optimize the oral therapies to such extent that we can uh, sort of extend the on without uh, bringing difficulties with dyskinesia or having other problems. Um, 
we often have said to our patients that levodopa is to Parkinson's what insulin is to diabetes, but we've never really kind of brought that metaphor to the next level of development, which is to say, well, we now need uh, insulin-like infusion systems for Parkinson's. We finally have that. Uh, there have been many, many attempts in the past. Uh, levodopa is not a molecule that uh, uh, is... Uh, uh, easy to uh, deliver in a transdermal uh, uh, form, but the subcutaneous infusion is now panning out to be very good. And the level of uh, benefit is, is quite significant. With all the challenges of uh, double blind, uh, double dummy clinical trial designs, uh, the interventions have achieved about close to two hours of extra on time. This is good on time, meaning the time that individuals have with uh, actually the best possible response where uh, they have an on either without dyskinesia or with non-troublesome dyskinesias, which is where the, the, the good on that we want to have our patients on. So uh, really quite uh, helpful. This uh, infusion systems are likely going to help us uh, in those patients in whom we might also be thinking of uh, deep brain stimulation or other surgical interventions. For them, uh, this might be an easier step earlier than that. And perhaps uh, it is possible that in many patients that go into an infusion systems, an advanced uh, surgical intervention might not be needed. So it's a way to start moving toward more physiologic restoration of uh, dopamine function in the brain. And I think it's going to be a welcome uh, arrival. Uh, we're probably a few months away to having the first approved. There have been uh, some issues at the regulatory level for the infusion systems, but once uh, they are approved, I think that they are going to represent an important resource for patients to have an improvement in their overall quality of life. Absolutely. I see patients every week who pr could probably benefit from these treatments. For me personally, it's just exciting to see more mechanisms being explored. There's a lot of work going on with neuroinflammation and Parkinson's for recognizing more overall lifestyle factors and wellness being important. So lots of developments. Anything else before we part uh, that you want to highlight that you are excited to, about in particular for the coming year? Well, um... The most excitement that I get uh, these days uh, is really about uh, the biomarker development program moving into an area which we're finally uh, becoming congruent with what we say. We've said to people forever that Parkinson's isn't a disease, and we tell our patients, uh, do not compare yourself to anyone else. Uh, you have your own brand of Parkinson's, you're blazing your own trail. But we follow that up by saying, but be hopeful because we'll have one day a biomarker of Parkinson's. And also we'll have a treatment that slow Parkinson's progression. And the savvy patient would say, well, you just said to me, I'm very unique. Are you saying also that there will be a treatment that will uh, be equally effective or somehow benefit everyone? And so everyone is, is very unique. <laughs> so of course, we're finally walking the talk when we say, no, 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 you are unique such that now we are beginning the process of identifying what is it about you, not that connects you to others with the same diagnosis, but in fact, what makes you different from others. And this is the platform that the field of oncology created to individualize the molecular biological sources of disease. We would be able in the future to tell to a, a patient with Parkinson's, you have Parkinson's, and just like an oncologist would say to a patient being diagnosed with that kind of cancer, says, I don't know what that means. I would have to do certain studies uh, in different tissues to be able to determine the, what is it that you have and then to be able to define what treatment to apply to your disease. Meanwhile, here's levodopa to make you feel better. <laughs> I mean that, right? I think that would be sort of a more honest uh, conversation. But we began that process. Like all changes in history, they are going to take a lot of effort. They are also uncomfortable. They are inconvenient but it's the right thing to do. So we're moving in that direction and this is uh, very exciting in many, many ways. Very good, and thank you for all your work you do in this really important area. So with that, um, we'll part and thank you again so much, Alberto, for this overview and thanks to all the viewers. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's been a pleasure always being with you.